introduce i want to introduce a seminar series titled critical transitions in complex system it's being jointly hosted by iit madras in india and potsdam institute of climate impact research aka pic in germany this seminar series brings together experts from various fields like climate science fluid mechanics neuroscience combustion etc and aims to disseminate the state of the art in the prediction of critical transitions in these diverse fields of study the seminars series typically take place every month on the last monday of every month for sometimes exceptions but mostly it's on the last monday please mark your calendars before i introduce the speaker a few housekeeping notes i request everyone to turn off their microphones except of course the speaker and please use the q and a box in zoom to ask the speaker your questions you can type your questions in the chat box and we'll address them in the end and the speaker will address them in the end now let me introduce the speaker uh, hank dykstra is a professor of dynamical oceanography at the institute for marine and atmospheric research within the department of physics of utrecht university his main research interests are on climate variability in particular climate transitions with a focus on the role of oceans he is a member of the royal netherlands academy of arts and sciences and a fellow of the society for industrial and applied mathematics in 2005 he received the prestigious louis fry richardson medal from the european geosciences union and in 2021 he was awarded the an advance grant from the ERCO european research union today professor dykstra will speak about Think of tipping of the Atlantic Ocean circulation. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. Yes. You can see it now. Yes, I can see it very well. And ah, excellent. Okay, good. Yeah. So thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. Um. So I'm glad to be here. It's uh, also an interesting series uh, which you organize. So I'm happy to be in this series. Uh, also happy to join the list of uh, the previous speakers. And um, today I, I'll talk about a uh, yeah an archetypal I would say critical transition in a complex system, uh, which is the Atlantic Ocean circulation tipping. And uh, I've been working on that for for a long time already, but more intensively actually uh, since I got this ESC grant uh, with the project Tauk, which started last October. And there's been uh, over the year quite some developments, not only in my group but also in other groups. So I ho hope to to get you up to date uh, with this problem. And uh, so I'd like to start with the you know the the oceans and climate. Uh, the the world is about seventy percent ocean. And so this, they play a big role in the uh, in the climate system. And the, the animation you see is what, what I call the marble, which is basically the earth from observation stripped uh, from the atmosphere, where you see this uh, very nice sort of overview of the ocean and basins uh, on earth. So first of all, uh, the climate system uh, is, a, is a complex system uh, in many ways. Um, you see here in the in the sketch here that it consists of different components which are interacting. So you have atmosphere, ocean, there's land, there's the biosphere, there's ice, and they all interact by exchanging fluxes, uh, could be of momentum, uh, heat, salt, radiation, etc. And uh, it is a, a very multi-scale system, and uh, there are interactions on multi-scales uh, between the components, but also within the components. Of course, the ocean flow and the atmospheric flows are turbulent. Uh, and so they they really act as uh, very interacting uh, systems. And then, uh, as I said, there will be a very sort of tight connection between all those components, uh, which can give uh, rise to a large, say, amount of behavior due to, say, different forcings here, but also a lot of internal variability due to, say, interactions and instabilities. So the um, what do we know about the uh, the sort of the climate system from observations? And there we have to be very modest uh, compared to other fields. There are instrumental data we call them from 1880. So that's uh, in the ocean, for instance, uh, measurement of uh, temperature and salinity. 
there are satellite measurements only of the surface from 1982. And then we have a large record of what we call proxy data. So those are from ice cores, isotope ratios, et cetera. But uh, those are, of course, limited in space. And they're also limited in temporal resolution. So in general, uh, you know, we have very limited data for hypothesis and theory falsification. Uh, let's keep that in mind. And uh, so how I introduce the uh, sort of Atlantic Ocean circulation importance in terms of critical transitions is um, by one of the ice core records here. So this is a record, for, as you can see, from Greenland here in the, in the summit of Greenland. And time goes here from uh, right to left, as the Earth scientists normally do. And then on the vertical axis, you see an isotope ratio of oxygen. That's basically a ratio of O18 over O16. But it is a, there's a sort of a relative temperature scale here to the right, which says this is about five degrees. And uh, what you see is that uh, the Earth came here from the last... Uh, say 120,000 years where we had the last interglacial, it went into this glacial cycle here with a maximum somewhere here at uh, 25,000 years ago. And then eventually sort of underwent a transition here to the present day Holocene. But there are those very strong fluctuation temperature here on Greenland, where you see that uh, there's a very slow decay here, the number 14 to say number 12, you see very slow decay uh, uh, to cold to cold conditions, and then enormously sudden warming here in the uh, uh, at number twelve. So the, the, these are sort of isotope stages. It doesn't really matter for for the story I'm going to tell you, but you see those transitions here. They're called Dunskirt Usker events, and it's been established that uh, the ocean circulation uh, changes played a major role in this uh, in this Dunskirt Usker events. And so the question is how how does how did, how did that happen? And uh, well, then you have to look at uh, what causes most of the heat transport by the ocean currents in the, in the ocean. Here we see the North Atlantic Ocean. So to the left, you see the red currents at the surface. Those are the Gulf Stream, and then they transport heat and salt water northwards. That cools in the north and gets denser. And then you get this sort of current at depth here below the Gulf Stream going southwards. And when you integrate, say, this current from, uh, say, from west to east, then you get uh, the volume transport through a certain section. So here you integrate from Florida to Africa, you integrate the transport uh, of volume. And then what you get is uh, a picture that looks like to the right. This is not observed. This is from a model. Uh, I'll, I'll show your observations in a minute, what we know about this. But here you see what is called the meridional overturning stream function. And uh, here it's units are in Swerdrup. So to give you an idea, one Swerdrup is about 10 Amazon rivers. And so through a section here at 40 North, for instance, or let's take, let's take here 30 North and the surface, there's about say 20 Swerdrups going northward between this section. And then it flows northward, then goes mid depth, goes southward. So this is this deep blue current, which you see in the left picture. Now this system, which is responsible for most of the heat transport we call the Atlantic Meridional Overturn Circulation. And I will use AMOC uh, from now on to make it a bit shorter. So that is the, say, the AMOC topic and the AMOC transitions where we're going to talk about. Now, what do we know about the AMOC? Well, we have, uh, there's quite some investment in, in research money, of course, to monitor what happens with the AMOC, and so there have been sections, for instance, here at 26 North, it's called the Rapid Mocha section, uh, which uh, is an instrument, very ingenious instrument to measure the volume transport between this section. And to the right, in the top figure, you see, uh, say, the what is called the AMOC strength, and that is, that is at 26 North, this maximum of this stream function. And you see here the AMOC strength uh, from 2004 here. This is where the instrument started, so the red curve. And the, you see the fluctuations in the, so these are multi-data in the, in the sort of light curve, but then you see the drawn curve, sort of the long-term average. And then you see that the AMOC decreased here from 2004 to 2014, and then sort of recovered after that. 
Now there's some other measurement here in the OSNAP. This is a program which started much later in 2014. You see the orange ones here. So there's very little data yet. Of course, it's it's this is a bit extended now, but they have only six years up till up till now. And then you see all those the gray ones here. Those are more uh, sort of uh, determined from inverse solutions from very limited observations. And so these are less valuable than basically these direct observations. But you see very limited data here to really sort of determine anything about you know how the AMO is going to develop over the next decades. And still there is this, uh, say, which you've probably seen also in the news. Um, there's this paper in 2021 from Nicholas Burrs, uh, also from PIC. He's now in Munich, but uh, where it was mentioned that, you know, observation-based early warning signals for a collapse of the Atlantic Meridian overturning circulation that was also headlined in the Washington Post and many more issues. And, and more recently, you've seen that probably too in the press that... Uh, there's a warning for forthcoming collapse of the Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation. So this was uh, from my colleague uh, Peter Dillifson and his sister Susan Dillifson, and it made a, a big uh, sort of attention in the press because you can imagine if the AMOC sort of would collapse, and I'll tell you more about that, of course, that you will have a lot of less heat transport northward, and so you get quite a cooling in the north, northern North Atlantic region, and so it has quite a climate impact which I will show you later also. So where was this based on? I mean, you cannot imagine that this was based on, say, observations uh, from the rapid array because they're too short. Well, instead, they were based on an idea which was announced in 2018, which uh, sort of claimed that you could reconstruct the strength of the AMOC by looking at a sea surface temperature anomaly in this region here, the blue region, which is called the Sopologia region. And um, well, they show here in the model to the left, this is one of the bigger models, so the climate models, where they look at, say, the uh, Sopologia region anomaly in temperature. And then they have also the AMOC, and you see there's quite a good correlation between those. And so the Sopologia has been used as a Sopologia sea surface temperature normally have been used as a, say, proxy of the AMOC. And what you see here is the to the right picture, you see this is then the reconstruction which is made. So this is the, um, say, uh, the blue curve here. And then you see that uh, basically here, if you, if you look at the, um, say, the correspondence to observation, so these are this, AMOC direct observation and rapid. Well, you know, there are discrepancies, but basically this is used as the best reconstruction for the moment of the AMOC in the history, in the historical data, so from 1880. And then these results on the AMOC slowdown were basically based on early warning indicators. And, and imagine these are very standard early warning indicators for critical transition. So that's increase in outer correlation, like one outer correlation, and also uh, the um, so increasing variance. And so this is based, this is the eventually the AMOC index signal. And then they looked at here the variance. Uh, this is paper from Nicholas Burroughs and the uh, lag one autocorrelation. You see the lag one autocorrelation indeed increases as is the variance, and which is a sign that uh, a, say, critical transition, particularly a settle node bifurcation, could be approached. And then Dittlefson, uh, and Dittlefson took that a little further by estimating also from, of course, assuming that there was a settle out uh, looking at the tipping time. And this made a big uh, sort of impact in the press where they mentioned 2057 as sort of the date where the IMOC would collapse, right? Plus or minus uh, about uh, 40 years. So this, of course, a wide range. So this is about the, uh, the, the attention for the IMOC collapse. I would like to uh, go back a little bit to the basics and uh, to the physics. You know, what is what is what is the physics of this potential collapse? And this is not so difficult to explain. Uh, you don't have to, you know, have a good background in climate to actually understand this. It's very easy. So in 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 this uh, picture here, I'll sketch uh, just the, the the buoyancy forcing at the top of the uh, ocean, and also uh, 
for a region here from the equator to the north. So this is north, northern North Atlantic. Now in the in the equatorial area, you have heat input uh, by the sun, and there's a lot of evaporation. So you have fresh water net going out. But in the polar region, it's the opposite. You get a lot of fresh water in because it rains a lot and the heat goes out because it's cold. And so you get basically you get this contrast in in heat and salt. Uh, you get a gradient over the over the ocean. And uh, if you assume that the ocean obeys a linear equation of state where the density is linear related to temperature and salinity, which is not uh, you know in the polar areas it, it's an approximation, but it's it's you know overall very good in the ocean. You see that when the salinity increases, your density increases, and when the temperature increases, your density decreases of ocean water. And so imagine that you would have a density-driven circulation with due pure by heat. So fresh water would be absent in the buoyancy forcing. Then it would be warm here in the equatorial area. It would be cold in the polar area. So it would be denser in the north. And so you would basically get a circulation that looks like this. And this is somehow the, the, the pattern we see also overall in the, in the AMOC. But if you imagine that uh, only a circulation driven by salinity, then here the fresh water goes out, so it's saline in the equator, and it's fresh at the polar area. And so the density is higher in the equatorial area, so we would expect a circulation like this. And so the main thing is that they actually work against each other. And this is important. And um, so to the, the pe person who realized that it could lead to very interesting behavior was Henry Stommel. And he published a paper in 1961, so very early already, where we just, you know, reflected just the, the mechanisms I just sketched. You have a two boxes, you have a polar and equatorial box, they're mixed well. You have a fluxes at the, at the top, so a heat flux and a, and a fresh water flux, this FS is a fresh water flux. And then you have a circulation which is driven by density differences. And I'm not going to go through this model, but this is a, a very simple model, just having the heat balances over the boxes and the Salt balances over the boxes. Uh, you see here the, the flux exchange here in the surface uh, due to the fresh water flux. If FF is positive in the polar box here, then basically you get a salt decrease. Uh, FS is fresh water coming in. And you see also here the term here, which is the transport between the boxes. So this is the advective transport. And uh, you can use different formulas for that. This is one. Uh, which is commonly used that it's quadratically in the density difference. And now the surprise was, and this was already in the Stommel paper also, that if you now look at what kind of steady states can appear, if you change FS, so the fresh water forcing, all other sort of parameters tuned to present day conditions, then you find this kind of bifurcation diagram. So here to the on the axis you FS, this is this fresh water flux. You see here the AMOC strength. And then you see here, you look at steady state. So for 0.1 FS, you have about 10 thread ups. And then basically what you see is that you go to a several node here and suddenly the, you get here, you can get a collapse right in the transient. This is of course not, these are the steady states. You get an unstable branch between the two several nodes here and you have a more salinity driven branch here where the sort of the circulation is reversed here in the, uh, on the lower part of the diagram. And so when you would do a, a transient simulation, so you would you would change the FS very slowly in time so that your time scale of equilibration to the mock would be smaller than, uh, than the change in forcing, then you would stay along this sort of branch. And then at L1, you would jump to the reversed part. And when you would reverse it, you go to this point L2, and then you would recover and you basically get into this uh, original state again. So you typically see hysteresis uh, in this type of uh, in this type of model. Now, what is the the feedback doing the collapse? And this is important for the rest of the talk also. So imagine you have this sort of temperature driven circulation, and you put a uh, so here the background is sketched. Also, it's warm, salty here. It's cold, fresh here. And if you put a fresh water perturbation in the north then your density gets lower. So your circulation will decrease. And what it does is it will transport less, say, heat northwards. 
which would make it cooler here. So that's a negative feedback, but it also transport less salt uh, northwards. And so that's a positive feedback. And which one sort of wins now is depending on the atmosphere because the salinity has no influence on precipitation, but of course, heat anomalies have, you know, they're strongly damped by the atmosphere. And so your salinity feedback, which is positive uh, wins. And so basically this gives you this uh, sort of collapse that the circulation will get weaker and eventually spin down. So this is the, the main mechanism of the AMOC collapse. It's just what we call a salt eviction feedback. And you can imagine this is very, you know, very general mechanism. I mean, you can, of course, there can be other uh, negative feedback sort of affecting it, but it will be difficult to oppose uh, in the in the ocean atmosphere system. So to look at that problem, there's now a whole hierarchy of models. I want to sketch you that briefly. So this box models here to the left that started with Stommel, and there's lots of them. Uh, this one picture comes from Wood, where they make boxes over the whole ocean. And the, the nice thing is they're mathematically very accessible, of course, so you can study mechanisms. And uh, But of course, they, they miss, you know, connection to so the multi-process, multi-scale nature of the climate system. So that is the disadvantage. There are 2D models, so basically meridional or vertical models. Then there's 3D models, where basically uh, there's there's sort of different geometries uh, to, to global, where you basically can look at uh, what happens uh, to this uh, sort of bifurcation diagram. And then there are sort of in between those Earth system models of intermediate complexity, which is are between those ocean only models and the big climate models, which are used uh, for climate forecasting, climate projections. And these are really uh, labeled by the CMAP, which is a Sort of uh, coupled model into comparison projects. And we're currently, we passed CMAP 6, so we're now into CMAP 7. And uh, those models get more and more detailed, uh, have lots of degrees of freedom, incorporate all kinds of small scale processes, etc. So that's a bit the, the, the hierarchy. And I first want to talk to you about uh, one of the models here, which we developed uh, a long time ago already. And this, this global model here, you see it's, it's a global model, it's ocean only, but it has full, you know, geometry and bathymetry and has sort of a full 3D, say, circulation uh, representation. And uh, so, so this is work already done in 2007 and 2005, so a long time ago. But what we were interested in, I suppose you do this sort of Stommel type of, of uh analysis where you put a freshwater anomaly here in the northern North Atlantic and you take that as a parameter and then you just compute how the steady states of this system will change. Then even in this model, which is uh, if you look at the degrees of freedom, it's about uh, half a million or so. So that's much larger than the Stommel model, which is two. Then still you find a relatively simple bifurcation diagram, which looks like Stommel. So it looks like this, this transition is embedded in a is very low dimensional in terms of this high dimensional dynamical system. Now you find uh, again these two settle nodes and the unstable branch, etc. But what is interesting, what we try to do from here is to, how can you what's the physics now of this L1, L minus, and L plus here? What what determines now the physics and can you relate that to observations? Now we came up with uh, and other people have mentioned that too. That is an important quantity, which is sort of an integral quantity of the transport over the southern boundary of the Atlantic. And there's also transport over the northern boundary of the Atlantic, but that is very small. So if you if you subtract both, you get basically the divergence of the freshwater transport. But as the north is very small, we usually refer only to the southern part of the basin. So that's the tip of Africa here for the Atlantic. And there's a quantity we call the FOV, FOVS. Where basically, if it's, if it's positive, then the AMOC exports salt over this boundary. And when it's negative, it exports fresh water. So that basically is the sort of integral quantity. And, and the nice thing is that if you look at this quantity and you, you, you compute it along the sort of this upper branch of this unbranch of the AMOC, then you see that uh, from point A here, it is positive. So that means that the AMOC exports salt. And when you get to the multiple equilibrium regime, which is between this L minus and L plus, you find that this 
AMOC, it exports fresh water. And so even if you're on the branch here and you compute the fresh water transport over the southern boundary, you can already know where the position of L1 is located. And what is also is that you find that the, the second cell node here, that's the L plus, is really related to near the minimum of the FOVS. So there the fresh water export is, is in, in this case, maximum. Now, of course, you can imagine it's still very, you know, a uh, limited model, I mean, it has no atmosphere. So there's been a lot of critique on this to say, well, you know, we have to believe in that this FOVS is an important indicator of a collapse, et cetera. And so, uh, well, that's left for, uh, we left that for a long time, but uh, very recently, and also due to this ESC project, we were able to uh, to test that actually into a, a very big model. So this the community Earth system model one, CSM, and uh, although, of course, other people have done that in Emacs and in Famous also, which is sort of between the CMAP5 models and the ocean-only models, we were able to do basically this uh, simulation uh, where you look at, um, sort of you take the CSM under pre-industrial conditions. So the typical resolution of the ocean here is one degree and the atmosphere is two degrees. We, of course, you need to spin up to really get the whole climate system into equilibrium under pre-industrial forcing conditions. And then what we did, it took this area here, this, this green area, and put fresh water here and increased that by a rate of uh, three times 10 to minus four square per year. So to be very, very small change. And then we integrated it for 2200 years and we end up eventually with a total fresh water input of about 0.66 sweat drops. And the, 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 to keep the salinity in the ocean constant, we'll compensate, say, this small this flux here over this region over the rest of the globe. Otherwise, uh, your salinity will change and you cannot really assess whether there are multiple equilibria for the same forcing. So there was quite a computation. It took about six months or so on a supercomputer in the Netherlands, which is a, you know, not a big, not a top machine, but uh, around 10, 10 petaflops. So it, it really is a, quite a computation. That's why it's never been done also before. And um, what you see is that uh, this is the AMOC uh, strength at 26 north. And you see in the top, you see the CN, you see the, the forcing level. So there's a cumulative forcing at the, uh, put in into the North Atlantic. It, it first there's some internal variability here in the AMOC and it decreases. And then suddenly here at say year 1750, you see it undergoes quite a enormous transition where it nearly is zero here uh, at year say 2000. And then at year 2200, we stop the simulation because it goes to and uh, looks like to an equilibrium uh, where you have an off state of the AMOC. So, so this is fantastic because um, we've shown now that actually this kind of tipping occurs also in a CMAP5 type model. And the community has often have the critique, well, you know, this AMOC tipping is, is a sort of thing for conceptual models, but as soon as you go to uh, CMAP5 or CMAP6 models, it will not occur because there's a lot of other feedbacks, etc. And this result shows that you actually, you, know, you can get this tipping. Uh, you need quite a fresh water forcing in this configuration, but it still undergoes this tipping uh, uh, just by uh, the salt of action feedback. So to show you uh, what happens to the atmosphere, just to give you a bit of an idea on the, on the climate impacts, to the left you see the animation of this uh, AMOC pattern. So you see the, the years in the top here. And then you see to the right, you see the two meter temperatures with respect to the beginning, first 50 years. And uh, so here we in year 1200, you still see there's a weakening of the AMOC, so you see a cooling. But then here in the year 1700, you see this enormous collapse appearing here. And then the temperature difference goes up to, well, between uh, about 20 degrees at maximum at some regions. And the change is so big that uh, if you look at the February temperatures in uh, Norway, in, in Bergen, for instance, in Norway, it's about three degrees per decade over the 100 years of the tipping. And so that is something, you know, you cannot adapt uh, against. So these are quite, 
course, it's a model, but you know, this is quite a model where people have done a lot of uh, projections of climate change with in the past. And so this is a, a lot more serious model uh, to consider than uh, all the uh, the other models are lower in the hierarchy. So if you look at this early warning, this was of course the first thing we try to do. So here you see this again, you see this mock, a mock to the left, uh, you see the a mock to black curve is the same mock say time series. And you see also this SST in the subpolar region, which you can also deduce from the model. And when you look at say the different regimes where FOV here, positive and near zero and negative here, then what happens is if you look at uh, the variance and outer, co outer correlation, well, this, you know, it's not, not real clear and it, overall it decreases. So this is not a simple settlement out. At least uh, we have to investigate that, but it looks a, little, a bit more complicated than that. And there's not sort of these early warning indicators which uh, basically show you that, you know, you approach a simple settlement out bifurcation. So we thought also because these indicators are very general, we thought of can we sort of devise a better early warning signal? And basically that is related to this minimum of uh, of this FOV quantity. So you see here the FOV in time, you see it passing through a minimum quite near the transition point, which is at, at year 1750. And so just before when it really undergoes this tipping, uh, you have this minimum. And so that is a really physics-based indicator because uh, this FOV is basically a, a sort of integral measure of the salt infection feedback. And so it really is a, a physics-based uh, measure of the collapse. And uh, when you look at, at observations here, these are to the right is a reanalysis data. So that's not full observations, but it basically is uh, sort of re reconstructed from models where observations are assimilated in. So these are all the different products. There's the soda and Aura 5. And well, you know, the, there's it's still limited data since 1960, but they look like they actually go into uh, more negative values. And so in that sense, you could sort of state that the AMOC is en route to tipping, but it's very difficult uh, to actually establish, you know, the minimum, uh, when, when which year would be the minimum. This is difficult from those, say, um, reanalysis data. Now, uh, if you make a, uh, show it again, the AMOC uh, time series, and uh, you see the, the arrow pointing to the forcing in terms of sweat up in the North Atlantic, to the right, you see this FOV. You see it indeed decreasing here, and then it goes through a minimum. So now you see that, uh, uh, see this gradual decrease. Then you see the uh, near year. Now, now it actually decreases uh, quite, a quite a bit more, the AMOC. Then it goes through the minimum here. Yeah, there's also some variance increase in, in the FOV quantity. Then there's a minimum there. And then soon after, basically you get this uh, collapse in the AMOC. And then of course the FOV will eventually become positive because you get uh, the whole circulation reverse. So you get actually net salt export out of the basin. Here are the reanalysis data. So this shows you that they basically, they have a negative trend. And then there's some CMAP6 projections where they look at the weakening of the AMOC and that's sort of in this direction also. In the CMAP6 models, you see don't see a collapse, um, but they integrate of course only up till 2100, but also in the CMAP6 models, there's biases there, which will also affect uh, whether you get uh, a tipping in say over the next hundred years or not. So this is the result of the uh, sort of the, uh, the the collapse simulation, but of course you might also uh, want to wonder uh, with respect to these earlier, say bifurcation diagrams, do we also see the hysteresis? And so we did that also. We did the reverse simulation. So that's the red curve. Again, you see AMOX strength versus year, but now the the years in red they they go to the left. So time goes backwards to the left here for the red curve. So you see this black has the collapse, and then we start at that year 2200. You go in here, and then basically what happens is that you get a recovery only at 
well, about the year 4100, where you basically see an enormous, really rapid increase. And then you get a recovery here. And uh, we didn't plot that here, but if you run further with a fixed flux of zero, then it gets to the original equilibrium. We didn't do the full simulation, but we ran a few hundred years to see whether it goes in that direction. So here we see that uh, very nicely, you see there's quite an asymmetry between the collapse and the recovery. It's a very slow collapse relative to the fast recovery, which is really typical of this Danskot events I showed you earlier. Of course, this is not in the last uh, climate, uh, last glacial climate, so we have to be careful with that, but certainly you see this asymmetry. And there seems also to be a, a large hysteresis with uh, of this model CSM uh, for this, uh, say, AMOC uh, collapse and recovery. So that's very interesting. Now, uh, we were interested in how, how does it relate now to the uh, bifurcation studies of the uh, earlier model I showed you also. Now, what you would expect here that is that uh, in this model, which has no, it's only ocean and, and uh, a prescribed forcing, uh, atmospheric forcing, that you would actually have a recovery at, at, at the point where FOV goes to zero here. And uh, so we, we actually did the simulation. Now the FOV goes to zero, I show you that here at model year thousand here. So that's the left picture. And when you look at the, uh, the point here, year thousand, that corresponds to year 3400. And so that would be here. And so it doesn't do that. So we were a bit worried uh, when we passed this point, say, so and didn't make a mistake or so in terms of the forcing, but that was not the case. Uh, it's just it's just a lot longer it takes to actually get this recovery. And so we investigated why that is. And so from this, you would expect that the recovery would be at FOV zero. So what happens is this. If you look at uh, the right picture first, you see here the, the on the time actually it goes from year 2200 to 4400. So that's basically the, um, say the, the, the in time, the recovery simulation. And then uh, here's plotted a diagram, uh, which is called the Hofmiller diagram, where we show the AMOC in the Atlantic uh, versus say the latitude here. And so we take the AMOC strength at at a certain uh, average over the longitude, and then we plot it versus of latitude. And then here, what you see is that this point where the FOV change of sign is about uh, near year 3400. And indeed, the AMOC here is sort of starting to increase. You see that, but it stays very weak and stays very weak. And then at some point, then suddenly you get this transition back, which is the recovery where it gets very strong. So it does something indeed at FOV is a sign change here, but then it's delayed by a long time before you actually get the recovery. So interesting to look at what happens there. And uh, here you see that there is an element in the CSM, a process, which is not in the original, say, models where we did the bifurcation studies for, which is sea ice. And so what happens here is that uh, if you just before the recovery, so 4090, so if you look at that somewhere here in the diagram, then this is the sea ice fraction in the Arctic and the Northern North Atlantic. And so that's the fraction of grid boxes which are covered by sea ice. And you see that sea ice is really a large extension here, still in October, say 4090 in the model. And what happens is that uh, the AMOC is still too weak and the heat flux here, because the ice there is very limited. So you have no exchange between the ocean and atmosphere, only below, say, this uh, sort of bluish area here where the sea ice is located. But at this sort of February 1991, just before the transition here, the AMOC is just strong enough to melt, say, part of the sea ice. And you get an open area here in the sea ice, which is called the Polinia. And basically what it does is that in this area, there's water. And so you get an enormous heat exchange between the ocean and atmosphere. And that draws convection here in the ocean. And that basically restarts the AMOC. And then it gets very quick because as soon as the AMOC restarts, gets a lot of heat transport northward, then the sea ice is melting very quickly. And then you go back and you make actually quite an enormous overshoot 
because there's a lot of reservoir here of heat and salinity also, which is built up. And once you get the circulation started here, that actually overshoots the mock, get a very strong response here, which is then eventually when you decrease the forcing is somehow uh, decreased. So there's quite a, uh, a, uh, a role of the sea ice here in terms of the determining the width of the uh, of the hysteresis. Now you might wonder why why is this now a sort of transient overshoot? Yeah, well, the equilibria are somehow located here, and then you have a transient overshoot. And to investigate that, we did some further simulations. Maybe look at the bottom uh, first, where you basically look at. Uh, you take these initial conditions here, so let's take it year 1500 here, and then you integrate in time, and you keep the forcing constant. So you really look for the statistical equilibria. Now we integrated that 500 years. That's not sufficient to conclude that it's equilibrium, but it seems to equilibrate here in a, a statistical stationary state. And if you look at here year 1500 or 20, 2900 in the recovery, then you, you integrate to the left here, and you see also that it's quite an equilibrium. And the same holds for if you look at this position here just before the uh, collapse, but after the FOV change, a sign change, then you see also here that they actually statistical equilibria. So the conclusion is from those simulations, though they have to be continued to be uh, conclusive in terms of equilibria, is that uh, basically what the sea ice does, it sort of expands the uh, region of equilibria of the off state. And that's due to this isolating effect of sea ice. And we did our first studies with a conceptual model where we had uh, looked at, say, the bifurcation diagram for the ocean, but then added the sea ice. And then you see indeed that you get an extended area of sea ice induced uh, or, or sea ice ocean induced equilibria, which is also confirming or, or provides an interpretation for these results. So uh, that uh, brings me to the end. And uh, I hope I, I give you an update on this, uh, say, critical transition in a very complex climate system involving the uh, Atlantic Meridional Overturn Circulation, that we now know that this is not only found in conceptual models, but this is found in certainly one of the CMAP5 models. And now this is the case. I would guess, you know, many more groups will try this in also in CMAP5 and CMAP6 models. And it will be found in other models too. I'm sort of convinced on that. And um, what is very important is that this uh, freshwater transport at 34 South, which is the tip of Africa, is a, is a very important indicator. From the physics point of view, it makes sense because an integrated, as I said, integrated measure of the salt evaction feedback. Um, but it's also showing here that actually you get this minimum of FOV just before you get the collapse. And this is very important as an early warning indicator. And then I've shown you that uh, the sea ice here, sea ice ocean interactions, that they actually are important and that uh, the conceptual models or the sort of models low in the hierarchy, they neglected that and that uh, you can only sort of, uh, yeah, that's and that was actually a miss uh, that that was thought to be important. And uh, you see from the uh, sort of more complete models now that this is an important uh, issue. And it actually makes it uh, very interesting if you look at, say, possibility of noise induced transitions, because this would even mean that, uh, say, AMOC, where the FOV is positive, so which transports salts. Uh, sort of outside of the base, and that they can still undergo noise-induced transitions. And uh, we're currently working on, uh, we did that already, uh, to really look at, you know, what's the transition probability from one state to the other here. And we did that already in very conceptual models. So we have a good idea. We looked also at now, we're looking at instantons, which are sort of the most probable path to make this noise-induced transition. But we think now that eventually we can also do it in the CMAP5 model. We can use these techniques to assess, say, the probabilities of transition between one and, uh, between those two states. And we found them now already, so we know, you know where they're located. So that makes it a lot more easy. 
So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'm I'm really looking forward to your question. I didn't look at the chat yet, but uh, I'll do that now. So thank you very much for this very interesting talk, and I see you have traveled in time. Uh, yeah. You can, yeah. The questions are in Q and A box. I think there are already some questions. So you can see it yourself, right? Uh, no, I don't see anything. Okay. Uh, I see you... only. Uh, I see only that. Uh, Please type your questions in Q&A box. So I don't see any questions. Like, maybe, uh, no, no, oh, the, wait. Yeah. I see it now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I can see it. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So there's one question from Stefan on uh, how models are doing uh, with FOV compared to observations. What this means uh, for how far from bifurcation the models are versus uh, the observations. Yes, well, there, there is a uh, there's a whole inventory which has been made on the uh, the FOV in CMAP six models, and there are uh, the the ones who have the right AMOX strength. They usually have an, uh, a positive FOV, so they are outside of the observed regime. And there are models which basically have a uh, so realistic FOV, but they have a too small AMOX, and. Uh, so what this means is that uh, these models have biases and that they should be corrected uh, to get actually a, a situation where you have a, a AMOC which has a sort of correct strength and also the FOV has a comparable value with observations. And that bias correction will shift uh, also the position of this uh, bifurcation point. So yeah, it, it, it of course depends on the model, but uh, I guess... Uh, the biases, if we did one bifurcation study now where we introduced uh, a bias in the Indian Ocean, which is usually in the models too fresh. And then you see that this bias actually shifts the, bifurc the, the, the collapse point to uh, larger values of the forcing. And so you would expect if you correct the biases that you would actually be closer to uh, the bifurcation with the present day situations. But that all has to be uh, assessed, of course. Okay, then I see also a question from Milan. Um, yeah, AMOC and AMO. So he can ask about, is there a relation between the AMOC and the AMO? Uh, yes, there's been many studies where um, actually the AMOC variability is an important component of the AMO. Of course, there's discussion, there's other people who are Sort of proposing the idea that is related to uh, say aerosol forcing, but uh, there there are many conceptual uh, models which show this relation between them. And also GCMs, uh, there's many papers on that, and uh, you can imagine also that if the AM AMOC varies, that you get changes in heat transport, which will also affect your temperature in the North Atlantic, and so also the AMO. But it's not. I don't think there's actually consensus in the community. Uh, that aerosols play a, a, a minor role compared to what is the what is sort of the role from aerosols versus the AMOC variability. I hope that answers it. Okay, then Jakob Hertig on the um, current status on using transfer operators. Yeah. Um, we've we've done uh, sort of looked at this this um, transfer operator approach, basically looking at uh, say the second eigenvalue of the transfer operator. Of course, we construct it into a low dimensional space because otherwise you cannot compute it. And um, there you can you can find uh, from a simple model uh, you can find early warning indicators because. Once you approach a bifurcation, and it need not be a saddle now, it can also be a crisis or a more complicated bifurcation, you get that this uh, eigenvalue actually uh, sort of uh, takes a minimum and then moves away from the imaginary axis. So there are results, but uh, uh, I don't think there's any recent approaches, at least not that I know of, that have tackled it uh, for the AMOC for sort of more extensive models. It's certainly something to consider. 
Okay. Then I have Andrea B2. She asks, uh, have there been general oscillator models based on the simple temperature and salinity gradients? Um, yeah, simple oscillator models. I'm, I'm a bit confused uh, what is meant by that, by general os oscillator models. Um, Can, can can is there's no way you can uh, you can uh, sort of explain that in more detail what you mean by general oscillator models? Yeah, we are allowing her to ask the question directly. Andrea, you can uh, go ahead and ask. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. yeah uh... So uh, uh, what I meant by general oscillator models is uh, like a general physics, uh, nonlinear equation probably that could, uh, that would be similar to the kind of uh, uh, temperature and salinity uh, fluctuations, the few equations you had displayed in the beginning. And you mean constructed from observations or, or just from basic physical principles? Yeah, the basic physical principles. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's, there's, oh, okay. Yeah, so there, there is a, as I mentioned in the beginning, there's a whole uh, hierarchy of models, uh, in, also in the box uh, model area, which uh, you can also capture all kind of variability of the AMOC. So yes, there's, there's a broad literature on that. And uh, there also, there have been uh, studies of early warning signals. Uh, I mean, the Wood et al. model, which I mentioned uh, very briefly, is an example where they, sort of extensively investigated that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, uh, from Rohit, a model concerning slow rate of change or parameter, what difference we will see when you consider fast rate of change. Yes, uh, we haven't done that, of course, uh, because it's expensive to do, but uh, there have been others who, who looked at this fast rate of change. This is paper by Johannes Lohmann and Peter Didlofsen and Pines. Uh, last year or the year before, 2021, I think, where they looked at uh, that if you uh, sort of make the range rate change uh, bigger, then you can actually get this rate induced transition. And uh, so that might also be uh, certainly possible in this kind of uh, sort of larger uh, in models like, uh, like CSM. Okay. And then there's a, a question from Yevgeny Podolsky. Uh, I could not follow what is the main source of fresh water in the system. How does its future magnitude changes affect the likelihood of the collapse? Yeah, that's very important. Well, the, 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 there are, of course, uh, say, estimates of, uh, say, land ice and melt water. This is one of the sources, but that, that is very uh, quite limited still. Um, there are other changes in precipitation which can happen in the North Atlantic, which comes from projections of, of climate models. And the magnitude of that, uh, combined with also maybe change in river outflow, uh, will add to uh, eventually the net forcing. And that will be, you know, redistributed in the system, which is much more complicated than what we did in this model simulation, where you put it in between 20 and 50 north. So, um, yeah, that's to be seen. Uh, I mean, what we're doing now, of course, is to try uh, to um, look at the uh, this this off state, which is very central in the collapse, uh, to follow that under historical forcing. So we did that already, and it exists under horizon on under historical forcing, and uh, and then uh, we follow it. We try to correct the biases, which we're now working on how to correct the biases eventually hoping that we can sort of find two equilibrium states under historical forcing with a bias corrected model. And then we, we can do the climate change simulations and see whether the projected change in the forcing will actually sort of are able to induce a transition yes or no. And it could be noise induced. Uh, so it's still a probability problem on, on if you are in a multiple equilibrium machine, what is the eventual transition probability? So that's all to be seen. 
I think uh, we are at the end of the questions. I have a, a question. So if you forecast yeah. a collapse, what can we do? <laughs> if you, uh, it depends uh, what is the time horizon and uh, yeah, there's, there's not much we can do unless, uh, uh, you know, reduce emissions of CO2 uh, very quickly. Yeah, okay. But okay. what you can do to adapt, uh, yeah, I mean, if you see this collapse uh, with this enormous climate impact, it's difficult to adapt against. So mitigation is the, stay away from this, this sort of uh, tipping point is the high, high priority. It, uh, unless we act fast, we are going towards a situation where we just be completely helpless. It looks like. I, if this is if, if this would happen, yes, there would be a, there, there would be a situation which you difficult to handle because it's also happening on quite a fast time scale. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see one more question. Uh, uh, one last question in the Q and A box. Okay. Yeah, from Amchodari. AMOC has any effect on the Indian Ocean? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there are there are of course the 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 you know the AMOC modifies also the atmospheric circulation, and so that that also affects uh, say um, uh, fields of precipitation and temperature over the Indian Ocean, but it's not very strong effect. Uh, so, um, but on the other hand, I mean, what we're thinking now also is that. That this problem of Indian Ocean biases is also related to the AMOC. So there is a maybe a sort of a, a connected problem. Because the, most of the biases occur actually over the Indian Ocean, uh, which affect the AMOC strength. And so that's an interesting uh, issue on coupling of AMOC and Indian Ocean uh, atmospheric circulation. But uh, I, it's not, uh, I mean, we still have to address that. More questions from Norbert. Oh yeah, see it, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, are there other ocean circulation on Earth similar to AMOC? Um, yeah, of course, there's also the, uh, you know, the PMOC, so there's an, also an overturned circulation in the Pacific, but it looks very differently. But it has also volume transport. So there are uh, different of those circulation, but they're not you know, they're, they're not sort of uh, susceptible to large-scale transitions. Uh, although although if you see the 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 mock as a sort of global feature, then of course the AMOC variation will also affect the, ha what happens in the uh, in Pacific Ocean. But that's also, uh, but, but there are, yeah, there are other type of uh, circulations in the other basins. Okay, I see also from Rohit again, if the model has having a big history, so does it mean you need to come back below L minus to come back to the stable state? Yeah, in in the conceptual uh, in the sort of the earlier models I showed you where you could compute the bifurcation diagrams, you actually got the, the hysteresis with wasn't determined by L minus. Uh, but if you have CIs, then your L minus basically shifts to the left. Uh, it shifts to larger to smaller forcing conditions. So, yeah, you have to come back uh, below L minus to get this. Uh, Get this uh, recovery. Now, there's also a, a trend, the transient effect, of course, it's not stationary. Yeah. So, we still have, you know, a transient effect in the forcing. And so, you have also overshoots. And it's difficult to decide how large this overshoot is unless you do simulation with different changes of forcing. And we didn't do that. So, that is. Uh... Yeah. There's also from, yeah. That brings us to the end of the question. So okay, I think, yeah, I think we're done also in the list. <laughs> yeah, amazing talk. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I, I guess everybody's clapping. You cannot hear it. And the next seminar will be on November twentieth by Professor Kira Renfell. She is a professor at climatology in Tubington, and she will talk about the climate variability from the local to the global scale. And this talk for a change will be on a Tuesday, uh, not Monday, because of some scheduling problems. Thank you all and see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.